today we have a very special guest here, Dr. Lowe, and we've been invited into the Public Library of Florence, Alabama, to the Alabama Renaissance Fair Channel. So remember, be quiet at home, don't talk too loud, and don't crunch those chips too loud. We are in the library, so be very quiet. We're going to have a really good lecture in just a few minutes, so we'll see you then. Sit tight. It says it's 2 o'clock, so I will go ahead and start and introduce our speaker and so forth. Uh, most people, most of you guys know me. My name is, can everybody hear me? Am I talking loud enough? We didn't set the, the microphones up because usually we don't need them. Uh, my name is Lee Freeman. My day job is local historian slash genealogist upstairs on the second floor at the library. I'm also a board member of the Alabama Renaissance Fair. This is our, what, 33rd year of doing this? which is pretty impressive, I think, for an all-volunteer nonprofit renaissance fair, which uh, that's the main thing I want to remind you of. The fair is uh, Saturday and Sunday, October 26th and 27th at Fountain on the Green, a.k.a. Wilson Park. So come and make merry with us. The Shoals Theater is also doing a production of Three Musketeers this weekend, which is slightly... Next weekend. Or next weekend, sorry, the, the weekend of the fair. Yeah. That fair weekend, they'll be doing that, which is slightly outside our time frame, but you know, it's just just by a few few decades. So some of us may be going to that uh, on that Saturday night. Our feast is coming up this weekend. Uh, so it is a sellout. So if you didn't get tickets, I'm sorry. The Royal Autumn Feast, which is a three-course medieval <laughs> banquet with period entertainment, is sold out. You would have had fun had you been able to go. If you do have a ticket, uh, hopefully you can, but it's pretty cool. We found out on Facebook people were trying to scalp tickets to our Renaissance piece, so go figure. Uh, anyway, I think that's all the events uh, I need to mention other than next week, uh, Dr. Carl Franks right here will be doing a topic called The Green Man, Development of a Mythological Archetype. And if you've ever seen those medieval carvings, of the green man on, in churches and cathedrals. Carl will be talking about the evolution of that myth and how it transferred from the ancient pagan mystery religions into medieval Christian Europe. Uh, this is the uh, Renaissance Fair Roundtables uh, annual lecture series. We've been probably doing this almost as long as we've been doing the fair. It's one way to quote Kermit the Frog from the Muppet Show introducing the open forum where Miss Piggy would usually wind up karate chopping the guest star. But it's one way we raise the intellectual level of the program and try to keep it grounded in real, actual history. So this lectureship is sponsored by the Alabama Renaissance Fair, the University of North Alabama History Department, and the Florence Lauderdale Public Library, who our own Jennifer Keaton does the PR for us. So today's speaker is Dr. Ben Lowe, who is in the... Uh, UNA Department of History. He's an associate professor of history. He was born in Shropshire. He got his BA at the University of Shropshire in the UK. There's no Shropshire around here, so the original <laughs> Shropshire. So he is English. Uh, he got his BA from the University of Durham, also in the UK. He got his PhD at the University of Edinburgh, and he's been at UNA since the autumn of 2018. His specialty is Roman archaeology, but he, I think, is interested in lots of different topics. So uh, he's written one book on Roman Spain. He's written a book on uh, ancient Cadiz and another book on the Greeks in Spain. Um, uh, his, his, as I said, his specialty is Roman archaeology. We first met him last year at the Renaissance Fair costume workshop over here in the Kennedy Douglas Art Center parking lot. He said, hey, what are all those medieval costume books? i got to go check this out. So we met him and found out who he was and where he was from. He said, hey, you might like to throw in with us. And after talking with him for about 15 minutes, I'm like, yeah, he's a geek just like the rest of us. He likes Doctor Who. And he likes Monty Python. So, yeah. I was also mentioning to him that Florence was celebrating its bicentennial last year. We were 200 years old. And just to put it in perspective, he said, the house I grew up in is older than your town. <laughs> so, uh, interesting enough, also his parents flew all the way from the UK just to hear him speak at this lecture. I'm kidding, they, they were already here on a visit, but his parents are here from the UK. So, uh, without eating up any more of his time, I will uh, introduce Dr. Ben Lowe, and I'll let him introduce his title because I'm not sure how to pronounce the name of the town. But it's 
you'll see it right there, a most notable dwelling, the UNA Domus Romana project, and the topography of Roman and medieval Medina. I wasn't sure how to say that. Thank you all for coming, and thank you to the Alabama Renaissance Fair for inviting me to come and bore you with my field work in summer. So, I was going to talk to you today about a project that I've started up in conjunction with the University of South Florida, Heritage Malta, and various international partners to examine a Roman domus, a Roman mansion, on the outskirts of the ancient capital of Malta, the city of Medina. Now, sadly, um, Malta features very rarely in Roman history. It first appears in the year 255 BC when a Roman army en route to North Africa raids the island. 37 years later, a Roman general Tiberius Sempronius Longus annexed the island from the Carthaginians and then she disappears from the panoply of Roman history. <laughs> She features occasionally in later references, just asides, occasional literary sources that talk about the shipwreck of St. Paul, a breed of small dog that is indigenous to the island, and now I've forgotten what the third one is, which is where the Cassio is. Um, small dogs, St. Paul, and textile making. Now, the fullest description we have of the island comes from a Sicilian Greek historian by the name of Diodorus Siculus. Now, Diodorus is writing about 40 BC, and he singles out the number of harbours that the island possesses, its artisans, the skill of its artisans, in particular the textile workers, and finally opulence of its houses. Now Malta and Goza possessed two eponymous cities in the Roman period. Gaulos, which is underneath Vittoria Rabat today on the island of Goza, and Melite on the island of Malta. And it's the second of these that we are interested in today. And it's situated here adjoining the modern town of Rabat. It's a 200 meter high outcrop, a good naturally defensible location. It's been occupied since the 8th century BC and was the city in which the Carthaginian commander Hamilcar surrendered to the Romans in 218. Like any Roman town, Medina would have had its share of public buildings. Now we know of several thanks to inscriptions. The first is an inscription that was discovered in, 17, in 1647 on the Matafa Hill. An antiquarian by the name of Giovanni Francesco Abela says that it was found amongst the ruins of a temple. A temple to the goddess Proserpina. Now it was erected by a freedman by the name of Crestion and was situated over here near the church of St. Michael in the region that Abela says was the Giordano di Toro Rey. Uh, we are, I'm standing on the site that we will be looking at so we're directly across the valley from the urban center of Medina. In 1747, a further inscription was found recording the construction of a temple of Apollo by an unnamed individual, and it lists all the parts of the building that he paid for. He paid for the pavement, he paid for the columns, four of the columns in the portico, he paid for the pilasters, decorated the columns, and a century later, this inscription was found. Now this time, the 
temple is named and the dedicatee is named. And both inscriptions, both the 1747 and the 1868 inscription, were found near Villegainon Street, near the Benedictine Monastery in the centre of town. And so it's quite possible that these two inscriptions both refer to the same building. And that's it. That is the urban topography of Roman Medina. So thank you very much. Uh, my name is Dr. Lowe and I'll see you all. <laughs> Sadly, none of, no trace remains of any of these buildings. And the problem stems from the fact that these were both discovered long before legislation was introduced to protect the archaeological heritage. In the 1680s, the Grand Master of the Knights of St. John, the Order of the Hospitaliers, a man by the name of Gregorio Carafa, uh, deliberately ordered the demolition of what was left of the Temple of Proserpina so that he could decorate the Hospitale Auberge d'Italie in Valletta. And the Temple of Apollo was looted by antiquary. Antiqu antiquity thieves between 1710 and 1747. So nothing is left. But Abelo reports that when he visited Medina in 1647, the streets, and in particular the cathedral here, square here, were full of fragments of Roman public buildings, columns, statues, relief work. And they show up in the paintings of Michele Bellanti, this is from Gatto Morina Street, and some of these are identifiable. So this fragment is now in the Domus Romana, Domus Romana Museum, so you can actually go and see it. So we're, we're blessed that that particular piece survives. Now, only in one place was any systematic excavation carried out. And it was here. This is the Domus Romano. And on February the 3rd, 1881, while they were decorating, the planting trees along the Esplanade, along the uh, gardens in front of the 16th century defences of the city, they hit a mosaic. And the mosaic was immediately reported to the Office of Public Works, and they dispatched the keeper of the Maltese Library, Antonio Caruana, to investigate it. He carried out limited excavations on the site that identified a peristyle house. Such was the splendor what he found, that he immediately ordered the construction of a small museum to protect the house. Now the, house, the museum was then expanded in the 19, early 1920s, and this prompted a renewed campaign of excavations by Sir Themistocles Zamit, who greatly expanded the site to include what you've just seen in our drone footage. The house is a spectacular one. It's decorated with a series of mosaics, the most famous of which comes from the peristyle. Where? The peristyle, the courtyard of the house. And it shows two doves drinking from a water bottle. And this was a very famous image in the classical world. It's actually recorded by Pliny in his Natural History. This sort of still life motif was a Greek innovation to capture a life of rural luxury. So you imagine the sound of the doves in a water bowl. It was based on a masterpiece from the city of Pergamon in Turkey by a man by the name of Sozos. And you can see other examples of exactly this motif, for example, in the oikos of the dining room of the house of the mosaic doves in Pompeii. 
or the palace of the Emperor Hadrian at Tivoli. So it's a very spectacular work of art to have immediately as you enter the house. Now the house is notable as well because of a collection of statues that Derek did decorated. I'm having speech problems today. Decorated the colonnade around the peristyle. Members of the imperial family from the year AD 50. They include the Emperor Claudius himself, his daughter Antonia, and the young future Emperor Nero. Now this concentration of imperial portraits from a very specific time frame is quite unusual and may suggest that the occupant of this house was somebody in an official position. Evidently, the sculpture, the portrait collection wouldn't have remained accessible for very long because as you may be aware, the Emperor Nero is not somebody you like to keep a statue of after 68 AD. So what happens after 68 is unclear. Now the house is notable as well, not just for its statuary and its mosaics, but because of its frescoes. These are Pompeian first style frescoes. They're designed to look like faux marble and date to about 100 BC, which would put this not only as early as the earliest houses, extant houses in Pompeii, but strikingly outside Italy. So this is unique and something very special is potentially going on. Now Zamit excavated the area to the northwest of the house. This is Caruana's museum building, or the modern rebuild of it, with the peristyle. Zamit excavated here between 1920 and 25, uncovering a network of smaller houses and a Roman road running down in this direction. He also excavated here, and a, this is a road the British built to link to the railway station that's on Matafa Hill, the other side of the valley. So we're going down into the dip, then you've got Matafa where I'm standing, and the Temple of Proserpina. And so this is all 19th century, and Zamit excavated here and down here. Now, sadly, even though Zamit was a superb archaeologist, he was mainly interested in the temples of Malta. Now, these are much more dramatic. They're the oldest monumental architecture in the world and rightly attracted his attention. But the upshot was that he published none of this. All but this area was filled in. So all we have today are his photographs. So this is Zamit himself, the mystical Zamit, and these are his excavations across the road to the railway station. As you can see, he has found a range of monumental architecture, no trace of which survives to this day. Four columns, masonry doorway, <coughs> So the problem facing us when we decided to start work here was what did Zamit find, where did he excavate, and before we can proceed 
we need to answer those two questions. So in June of 2019, we decided to conduct a GPR survey, a ground penetrating radar survey of the areas that, that Zamit looked at. So we focused on area A, area B, and the facade of the museum, area E. Uh, we will come back and in the future explore the areas over there. Now ground penetrating radar is a system usually used in archaeology for the detection of low subsurface archaeological features. The way it works is you bounce radar waves from the surface, you measure the elapsed time from a radar, radar wave being released at the surface, hitting a feature, submerged, submerged, subterranean feature, a wall, a use area, a cultural feature, and it's ricocheted back to the surface. And that enables you to identify the presence of subterranean features. And this is what we found. This is area A, so this is the area immediately to the north west of the excavations by Zamit. And we actually have two features that turned up. Firstly, you'll see on all of these an undulating continuous line about 0.8 to 1.7 meters below ground level. This is probably the bedrock. But we also detected two further archaeological features. Now at this stage, I can't tell you what they are. Probably a wall, to be honest. But now what we did then, now what, what GPR allows you to do is not only detect subterranean features, but also to create a 3D image of what lies beneath. And to do this, we took horizontal time slices, which means that we distinguished different depths or time sequences by color. So blue is zero, one is red. So you're now able to visualize the, relation, the spatial relationship of the different archaeological features that showed up in one dimension on the previous GPR result. Enabling us to marry these two together and create a 3D image. Now the final stage in the process is to take that time slice and overlay it onto a Google Earth image so that you can now see the relationship of the two walls, the two areas A that I picked out in the original in relation to the modern topography of the site. Now we did this for all the areas. You'll be happy to learn that I will not show you every single result and I'll limit it to the final stage and the uh, time slice overlying the Google Earth or drone footage. This is area B, so this is where the Zamit photographs that I showed you come from. We've got two large void, elongated void areas. Probably some form of channel or something like that. And a substantial built structure. We think possibly in the light of the proximity to the edge of the town that what we've actually got here is the city wall and a tower. If you ever join us 
you all know that down here on the road, there's actually some blocks that might pertain to the city wall as well. Thanks for joining in this wonderful lecture with my friend, Dr. Hope you enjoy as much as I do. I love to be able to spend time. It must be coming summer, but probably not going to be able to. And don't forget to hit like and subscribe. Don't forget to ring that bell. We'll see you next time. Bye-bye.